So good to be here. I appreciate everyone. And man, that was the best worship service that I've been in in a long time. I enjoyed that as much as anything. They're, they're anointed. The whole family sings. Man, Hunter's got a voice, doesn't he? I was shocked. I remember when he was in diapers. I remember when, when you were single. You know, back <laughs> way back then, um, he was, what, like two or three years older than me, like something like that. When were you born? Yeah, now, but nowadays, now, now he's like 10, 12 years older than me. He's, like, he's moving out. <laughs> I was, you know, I was, um, uh, I appreciated Buddy's, uh, I, I remember when Buddy was a lot smaller. And he comes up here. And yeah, yeah, we lived in Tulsa with him, and he he came up here. I was expecting him to say something like, "You don't give, I break your kneecaps," or you know, like he's the muscle. But he's got a real revelation of giving that has no violence connected to it anywhere. I think it's wonderful. But it's good to be here. Thank you for having me, and um, we're gonna. Well, you can be seated. I, I know this resets the clock when you stand up. Uh, I'm a guest, so I don't really know how long you normally go, but I'm not long-winded, so you're, you're in good shape. We'll get out in good time. and uh, Just appreciate Steve and Kim and the friendship that we've had over the many years. And just I just look forward to the future. I don't know about you, but I'm excited about the future. Yeah. I'm, I am excited about what is ahead for the church and for us. And you have to look at it that way. We've been preparing all of our lives for what's just about to happen yeah. and what's happening. And we are well prepared for, for uh, to do the will of God in these days. Amen. I want to talk to you about faith, the subject of faith. I went to Ramah and... Uh, I've preached faith for many years, but I did a real study on this subject last year and spent months and months and months uh, going through the, the scriptures and the doctrine of faith. And one of the things that I discovered, uh, there were many things, but one of the things I discovered is when things are going well in any area of your life, it's very common for us to coast in our faith and think that we're really believing, but we're just coasting. And then when you face a real challenge, you go, wait a minute, I knew how to do this at one time. We need to get our faith engaged, and we need to live the faith lifestyle, walk by faith, live by faith, overcome by faith, uh, now more than ever. It is a great day to, for the church to walk by faith. And uh, I'm going to give you um, sort of an introduction to this. And I do have some, some USBs back there that I'll explain later. And there's a lot of um, free material on my website. But I would encourage you to feed your faith. One of the reasons that Christians may be struggling at this time is they're watching too much bad news. You can't, you can't have that much intake and not have it affect your life. So the way to reverse that is to limit the bad news and increase the good news. Yeah. If, if, if I could just get Christians to just put more good news, more gospel, more Bible teaching into their lives, it makes a difference. I, I have a, uh, an internet program called Good News, and it's called that on purpose. Um, and I gave them a challenge. I said, if you listen to 20 of my episodes in 30 days, it, I guarantee you it'll change your outlook. You'll see things different. You'll think different. You'll be happier and more free. And uh, many people took that challenge. And, and it's not rocket science. It's, if you just put the word in over time, it That's makes right. a difference. Yeah. That's right. You know, if you're very unhealthy, and you've had an unhealthy lifestyle for many years, and you decide, you know what, I'm going to change. I'm going to get healthy. And you go out and eat a really, really healthy meal. It's not going to change your life that day. If you knew that, that didn't work that way. Say, well, I did that. Now I'm going to go eat what I want. That's not how that works. And the, and the word's the same way. Right. It does change your life. Yeah, yeah. But it, it's a lifestyle. Yeah. And, and uh, the church today has gotten too used to not getting enough right. intake. They don't get enough teaching. Yeah. Just 
plain and simple. You can't finish this race by willpower alone. Just because you made a decision to follow Jesus at some point in your life doesn't mean that now I'll just push through and make this happen. You need fuel for the journey. And you don't get that by wishing it or just by having a positive mental attitude. You have to really put fuel in the tank. Amen. And it comes through the word of God and, and good word-based teaching. Uh, not politics, not, not people speculating and politicking, but real word yeah. teaching. Amen. That's good. So, well, I just want to know what's going to happen. You really need fuel is what we need so that whatever happens, we're ready for it. Yeah. Whatever happens, I'm going to overcome. I'm going to live my life. We only got one, and I'm not going to put that on hold just because things have gone crazy. We need to live our lives and, and do what God's put us here to do. But to do that, you've got to have fuel. And I, I just believe the church is severely malnourished. And, and I'm talking about the church worldwide. And, and we'd see a lot of difference if we'd just change our diet, our yeah. spiritual diet. Yeah. That would do something in and of itself. You know, when you eat food, you don't have to really understand it all. You just put it in. <laughs> You don't have to tell that protein where to go yeah. right. to, f to make things better for you. You know, there's, there's literally churches that have devalued the Word of God because they don't consider the actual Bible relevant, as relevant as their new age ideas and their philosophies. And they, they give a little word and then a whole lot of <laughs> fluff, <laughs> whatever, filler. Um, you know, but it's like, uh, it's like taking an egg. If you were to take an egg and say, you know what, if you would eat this egg, let's say you had a very important business meeting tomorrow and you've got to meet with people on, across, across a, a boardroom table and really make some big time decisions. And I were to advise you and say, look, you need to, you need an egg. You need two eggs. Two eggs would really help you in this meeting. You say, well, eggs are ancient. What do they have to do with a board meeting? I mean, I go in there and I do my thing. Yeah, but eggs really are relevant to today's modern life. Are they not? Have we advanced beyond eggs? <laughs> do we not need eggs anymore? We're so sophisticated and so advanced that eggs have just been done away with. No, but if you take the egg with you to the board meeting and put it on the table and, say, well, and they'd say, well, what's that for? Well, my pastor said I should have it. Oh, here it is. It won't do you any good. If you want to make an egg relevant to modern life, eat one. <laughs> eat it. Right, that's good. So I just don't see how the Bible written 2,000 years ago and 4,000, how is it relevant to modern life? They didn't have an IRS. They didn't have computers. They didn't have software. You know, how is that relevant? You have to eat it. You have to put it in you. That's good. You need a steady diet yes. of the Word of God. Yes. 30 years ago, back when Steve was only in his 50s, <laughs> uh, <laughs> we used to go to church three times a week, every week, yeah. bare minimum. Yeah. And they would preach for an hour. Sometimes I was one of them. I would preach for an hour. We'd get an hour sermon and then other things. And we did that three times a week. And then several times a year, we'd go to seminars and go all week, three times a day, four times a day. And then we'd watch Christian TV or we'd listen to Christian radio. Back then, we bought what was called cassettes. <laughs> Google it. <laughs> and we'd listen to cassettes and we'd read books. And we got probably, you know, and nowadays they say the average church member goes to church two times a month. You compare that to what we got on a regular basis 30 years ago, and you can see why even Christians are dealing with weakness and, and depression and all kinds of symptoms. But the root cause is lack of nourishment. That's right. That would solve so many problems. Yeah. If you went to the doctor and you were skinny and emaciated and you said, Doc, I don't know what's wrong with me. I don't have much will. I don't have any discipline. I can't really get up and walk like a regular person. I just don't understand my problem. 
Now, he could tell you how important it is to live your life and walk and, and discipline and exercise. He could tell you all that. But if your problem is lack of food, then all of that self-help's not going to do any good. We could set you down and say, look, you're a human being. You're supposed to walk on two feet. Here's how you do it. And we could explain how to do it and tell how it's so helpful to get across the room instead of crawling the way you're doing. And we could condemn you for, for laying around all day and being depressed and melancholy. And we could criticize that. But if you are suffering from starvation... None of those things are going to change you. And I see the church today with all these self-help books trying to solve problems that are caused by a lack of the Word of God and a lack of fellowship with God and spending time with God. That would solve so many problems. So that this isn't my sermon. This is, this is my message to you. Take all those devices you have that are bringing instant information from around the world into your ears and your eyes and use them. Use them. Don't throw them away. I'm not a caveman. Use them. Just put the word on them. Put, fill them up with the word so that you're constantly feeding on the word of God and cut out some of this other stuff that's speculation. Feed on the word. Get it on your phone and on your computer. and on, on. Get a smart TV if you have to. And uh, I, I have something right here. And now this is for purchase. But we have things on our website you can stream right now for free. But I do have these. But, but we put this together. It's called You Have the Spirit of Faith. It's 20 sessions on You Have the Spirit of Faith, 30-minute sessions, and 15 sessions on The Spirit of Faith, what that is. That's 35 30-minute programs plus study notes. If you plug this into your smart TV, it'll come up as MP4 videos, and you can watch 35 videos. I dare you to binge watch this. That's good. If you plug it into your car, it comes up as MP3 audio. Same messages and you can listen to it you can put it on your computer and put it on your phone but these kind of things are valuable in this day and time there's no political agenda here it's simply teaching the word of god and we try to put a lot of spiritual high octane fuel into every message so that you can listen to a message and really get something that's going to stick to your ribs and, and that kind of teaching is, I believe, it's something that we need today. Yeah. And as I said, you don't have to buy this. Uh, you can go to our website, and we have all kinds of things that are free that you can download or stream that will do the same thing. But do something. Yeah. Don't let life catch you by surprise. Let's make a difference. Amen. Yeah, amen. Amen. That's good. You know... It, it, you know, it's a great and wonderful day when you walk down an aisle and give your heart to Jesus. But we need to be told that when you make that decision in order to finish your course with joy, yeah. you're going to have to come back to the Lord yeah. and get your daily bread. Yeah. It's not just a one-time decision and that's it. That's right. You know, if, you, if, if, if God gave us a lifetime supply of spiritual fuel the minute we got born again, he'd never see some of us till we get to heaven. And it's like, oh, what's your name again? <laughs> but God wants us to come regularly and feast at his table. And, and uh, we, we need it now more than ever. And I'm just concerned the church has gotten so far away from that. They don't even know what their problem is. They're associating with other things. And they haven't had a good meal in, in, in months. Am I right? All right, not, not here, but I'm saying church worldwide. And even here, you cannot live in this world with just two services a week, and that's all your spiritual diet. You've got to supplement yeah. right. to be strong. You've got to supplement. That's right. yes. yeah, that's good. I have a granddaughter. I know, it's not even, actually, it's not a granddaughter. It's my daughter has a child. And uh, so, so she, came, she came to see me, and she was just real small. They don't live close to us, so I don't see them a lot. When she was a little girl, just a little bitty girl, she, uh, she was, I got some Skittles. And, man, if you want a little girl's attention, get yourself some Skittles. 
So she's sitting on my lap, and she's, we're kind of getting to know each other. She's about two, and I've got on this whole bag of Skittles. And uh, she'd just sit there, and she'd go, candy. I thought, that is the cutest thing. And so I'd get a Skittle out, and I'd give her a Skittle. And she would eat that, and then it's candy. I said, I I said, say, candy, Peppa. And she'd go, candy, Peppa. And I'd give her another Skittle. And so, now I had a whole bag of Skittles. You think I'm going to give her the whole bag? Not on your life. We got a whole lot more to go than just give her a bag of Skittles. I'd never see her again if that... And that but, but we had some really good fellowship. I'd say, uh, uh, say, say, please, Papa, could I have a Skittle? And she'd say that. i say, now say, thank you, Papa. And she'd say, thank you, Papa. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> Now, they're older now. Takes a lot more money. But um, I could impress a two-year-old, I can tell you that. That was fun. But, but, but God's not that different, that much different than us. He wants to see us. He doesn't want to give you everything all at once. He wants a, an ongoing interaction and fellowship. And, and we should want that, but we don't, we don't function properly without that. So get in the word. Get the word in you. Let me give you some scriptures for life. These will help you live life in these days. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1, Paul told Timothy, Know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. Well, I'm glad somebody knows it. You know, we're all going, what in the world is going on? And it's nice to know that the Lord understands all this, that he saw things coming and, uh, and he warned us about it, which means he's not that concerned. He just wanted to let us know. Second Timothy 3, 1 in the Amplified said, but understand this, that in the last days will come perilous times of great stress and trouble, hard to deal with and hard to bear. So he's talking about some of the days we're living in, and, and it's not that big a deal to God. We need to realize, and I want to encourage you today of, of this one thing, that no matter what is going on in our world today, God's promises are still true. God's plan for your life is still true. God still has a future for you. Don't believe the lie that because this and this happened, now I'm never going to be or I'm never going to do or I'm never going to experience what I could have in life. God's will for you has not changed and God is not intimidated and God's arm is not shortened and we can believe God and be just as excited about our future as we ever were. Nothing Nothing has changed in heaven and in God's, on God's timetable, in God's economy. Nothing has changed. Relax. The Bible tells us that in the last days, men's hearts will fail them for fear of the things coming on the earth. So that is a very real uh, thing that, that, that the scriptures recognize, but it doesn't have to happen to us. We don't, have to, uh, we don't have to allow it to affect us. We have the opportunity to walk by faith, to live the life of faith. And the more I get into these things and study them, the, the, the more I feel sorry for people that are outside the church. They don't have this option. They don't know what it is to live by faith. We can be happy when everybody else is upset. We can be at peace when everybody else is worried. We can be healed when everybody else is dealing with sickness and disease. We can have uh, the, we can be, be, be the calm in the midst of the storm. Because we walk by faith and not by sight. We look not at things which are seen, but we look at things which are not seen. We march to the beat of a different drum. They're all going this way and we're going this way. They're worried about this and we're saying, I, my God shall supply all my need according to his riches and glory. I told you this word. God's promises are not limited to good times. They're not limited to certain generations. He never said, when things get really bad, all bets are off. Some of my promises just won't work when things get really bad. But until then, enjoy yourself. No, it, it, they work. God's promises work till the very end. They haven't changed one bit. And we need to be committed to that and, and hold on to that. 
so that we're not, because the powers that be, whatever you, whoever you think that is, are trying to scare us and intimidate us and paralyze us and put us in, the, in a corner and neutralize our effectiveness. And I'm just not, I'm just not going to buy into it. That's right. You know, they were predicting a really fierce winter this year. Oh, it's going to be cold. I said, how do they know that? They can't even predict the next 10 days properly. How are they going to tell me what's going to happen three months from now? And the reason I say that, and I do have an attitude, when I started traveling in 1989, um, and I think it was maybe the next year, 1990, I mean, I didn't have a lot. I was, you know, I've traveled enough to pay the bills, and that was it. And it's like fall, and they're predicting a very, very harsh winter. And they said, you know, it's because the woolly worms and the trees are doing this. And, the, and they got all these scientific and unscientific reasons why this is going to be a tough one. And so I went to the, I was getting cold. I had a lot of churches in Colorado scheduled. Steve's dad was one of them. And I'm thinking Colorado in a harsh winter. And I got cold and it was 75 degrees outside. I'm just going, oh, I can't. So I went to the department store and I bought an overcoat and a big old wool thing. And I spent money that I could have used elsewhere. So I got this big old coat because I'm going to be ready for this harsh winter. Well, I think I wore it twice. Because I'd paid for it and I didn't want to waste it. And after that winter was over, I happened to be listening to the news and they said, last winter was the mildest winter on record. And I thought, that's it. That is it for me. I am not going to take my cues from people who don't know what they're talking about. It's like they're, it's like, you know, now that I've done some TV work, I can see it all happening now. It's like, hey, you got to fill up 30 minutes and the camera's on, go. And they're like, um, tragedy is coming soon <laughs> to a home near you. I mean, they got to fill in this time or they won't get asked to come back. Yeah. And evidently nobody cares if they're wrong because yeah. they keep getting asked back. What makes you an expert? Because I've made a prediction every year for the last 20 years. Were they right? That's beside the point. I'm an expert. And you're not. <laughs> I am tired of flinching every time they raise their hand or say they're going to do it. Something's going to... I mean, we should have learned this with the, the nuclear holocaust. Did you go through the nuclear drills? Some of you are old enough to have done that. Yeah. Like you're seven years old and you're thinking about what snack is going to be served, you know, and, and recess. And they're like, everyone get under your desks. We're going to have a nuclear bomb drill. And so you got to climb under your desk and put your head down and prepare for a nuclear blast. Now, I actually paid attention in school. I want to know why are we doing this? And they explained it. Because Russia has all these missiles, nuclear warheads pointed toward us right now. And we got all these missiles pointed at them right now. And at any moment, somebody could push a button and launch those missiles and the whole world would blow up in one big nuclear blast. Now get under your desk. And I'm like, oh my gosh. This is horrible. I don't even want my apple. <laughs> so, so I go home. I'm trying to go to sleep at night. I can't go to sleep because Russia's got all these missiles pointed at us and they could, they could push a button and we'd all be dead before morning. So I called my dad. I said, Dad. He comes in, what's wrong, son? They don't teach you this in parenting school, I don't guess. I said, I can't sleep. He said, why not? I said, glad you asked. Russia's got all these missiles. <laughs> They're pointed at us right now. And at any moment, even while we're asleep, somebody could push a button and the whole world, and, and my desk is at school. I, I, can't, I can't go to school in the middle of the night and get under this nuclear bomb shelter of a desk that the government has provided for us. 
He was caught completely off guard, and he said something to the effect of, well, son, we've all got to die sometime. <laughs> what? That's what I'm saying. I don't want to go that way. <laughs> so I did what any kid would do at that age. I said, Mom. <laughs> And then there's the ozone hole. And then there's the meteorites from outer space and global warming. And it's, it's really a matter of do you want to freeze to death or do you want to burn up? And what we need to realize is they can't all happen. How is this? How can we be worried about all of it? It can't all happen. The point is, the powers that be are trying to scare us. They're trying to control us by fear, and I'm just not buying into it. The, the, you know, any time that I spent worrying about nuclear holocaust was wasted time. Isn't that a tactic of the enemy to get you worried about something you can't change? While the world you live in is, falls apart, my room's a mess, my hair's a mess, you know, I haven't taken a shower, it's like, well, the world could come to an end. Well, that doesn't excuse you just to stop living. We can't stop living. I'm not going to stop living. We, we were put here to live life and to, and to, and to enjoy, to be happy. Amen. I try to tell a lot of jokes and be funny because, because I think it's just giving the devil a black eye. You can't make me cry. You can't make me dread the future. You can't. We, we've got the brightest future in the world. Our future gets better and better. Amen. I refuse to be manipulated by that, by those negative emotions. I'm going to walk by faith and not by sight. How about you? Amen. We can be happy and, and full of joy and, uh, and do it in any, in, in any climate. All right, let me give you this verse, John 16, 33. Jesus said, these things I've spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation. And that word means pressure or trouble. But be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. Aren't those comforting words? Now, I was looking at the Amplified in this verse, and it's really expands on it. It says this, Jesus is saying, I have told you these things so that in me, in me you may have perfect peace and confidence. In the world, you will have tribulations and trials and distress and frustration. How many of you figured that out? Yeah. This isn't, we're not being picked on. We're not an unfortunate generation. Trouble comes in the world. That's just how it is. But he says, be of good cheer, take courage, be confident, certain, undaunted. Can I just say that again? This is a word to, to, to you and me. It's this. Take courage, be confident, be certain, be undaunted. I'll take that as a, as a, a word from Jesus. For he says, I've overcome the world. I have deprived it of power to harm you. And have conquered it for you. The world doesn't have the power to harm us. Greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. We are overcomers. We're just looking for a place to overcome. And the world's providing a lot of opportunity for that. That's fine. That's what we do. It's okay. It's okay to have challenges. You can't train your whole life for a heavyweight fight and then run when the opponent gets in the ring. We, we were born for this. We're ready for this. We can do this. Is anybody getting encouraged today? Yeah. And I'm not just trying to have a pep rally. It's not just positive, uh, positive mental attitude. That, but but our, our position is, is built on scripture. God does not want us to live life afraid of the future. We, we can enjoy and thrive. And the, and, the, and the worst things get, I mean, we're in the minority. <laughs> it's not, we don't have any competition. Everybody's either scared or mad. Am I right? That's right. I'm not mad and I'm not scared. I'm not, I'm not against anybody. I'm for everybody. Second Corinthians 5 says, we walk by faith and not by sight. I'm going to get to something here, but, but let me read a few of these other faith scriptures. Second Corinthians 4.18, 
I quoted it already, but it says, while we, we do not look at things which are seen, but at things which are not seen. The things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. We have the faith option. The world doesn't have that. We can look to God and look to heaven for assurance. You know, every uh, institution, um, organization that people in the natural world use to make sure that they're looked to, to make sure they're okay, is being shaken. You can't look to government or the economy or investments or whatever you look to to make sure, okay, things are still good. Not, not All those indicators are, are failing, but we don't have to look to any of those anyway. We look to God. We stand on his word, and, and God has not changed in... Uh, in our lives. The faith option is, is an option that only we have and we need to just decide we're going to walk by faith. We're going to live by faith. We're going to fight the good fight of faith. We're going to go from faith to faith. We're going to overcome and it's the victory that overcomes the world is even our faith. Thank God for faith in the word. Let me give you this. Hebrews 11, uh, this is the, the chapter on faith where there's all these heroes of faith but I like what it says in verse 33. The subject here is doing is living life through faith. Notice verse 33. It says, who through faith subdued kingdoms. Now I'm just going to put this phrase before every description because that's the context. Who through faith subdued kingdoms. Through faith worked righteousness. Through faith obtained promises. Through faith stopped the mouths of lions. Through faith quenched the violence of fire. Through faith escaped the edge of the sword. Uh, out of weakness were made strong. Through faith became valiant in battle. Through faith turned to flight the armies of aliens. And, it, and, and the list goes on, but they did these things through faith. So the, the, the moral is, I don't care what the problem is, the answer's doing it through faith, facing it in faith. The, the, the problems change with generations. There was Goliath, and there was Pharaoh, and then there's a, a, a Red Sea, and then there's a, a whatever, a storm or a mountain or whatever your, your challenge may be. Those challenges change generation to generation, but the answer's still the same. Today, we get to face our challenges the same way they face theirs, through faith. Their faith worked for their challenges. Our faith will work for our challenges. Amen. Amen. We are believers, and we were put here to live life in 2021. It's not my fault. I didn't ask to be born now and deal with the things we're dealing with. That's, why, that's where we are. Let's just do it. Let's live life to the full. Let's be who we were called to be. I'll, you could read Romans 8. There's several examples of things that we overcome in Romans 8. But I want to take you to Luke chapter 8. And I want you to look at this account. And I, this is one of my favorite stories, faith stories in the Bible. Because we can learn so much from Luke chapter 8. This is when uh, Jesus went across the, the, the Sea of Galilee in the boat with his disciples. And I just want to... I just want to, to set this up for you because it's so applicable to today. Verse 22, Luke chapter 8. It happened on a certain day that he got into a boat with his disciples and he said to them, let's cross over to the other side of the lake. And they launched out. Now, could you imagine being one of the 12 and being invited to go on a boat ride with Jesus? Could you imagine anything more magical than that? Like we're going to get away from the crowds. We're going to have his undivided attention. We're in the will of God. We're on a mission for God. And God has specifically said, let's go to the other side. You couldn't be more in the center of God's will if you tried. Everything is going right in your life. And you're going to spend a cruise with Jesus. What could go wrong? And they sailed out. And they sailed right into a storm. It says in verse 23, as they sailed, he fell asleep and a windstorm came down on the lake and they were filling with water and they were in jeopardy. Now, you know, you would think if you were to take a boat ride with Jesus who was 
obeying the Father that you would be able to get across the lake with... You, I mean, I, I would think it would be like a Disney movie. <laughs> with the rainbow and the birds singing along. You know, what's that song? Uh, singing, uh, whatever they, that Disney song is. <laughs> it's a small... No, a better one than that. Like... A, uh, Somewhere over the rainbow, Some, something, something happy, and 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 it's it's Jesus. There may be angels singing, and, and you know there'd be an angelic escort uh, that would be taking care of Jesus, and 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 you would never think in a million years that you would get in a boat with Jesus and sail into a storm. I mean, why would you even do that? Why wouldn't uh, God the Father say, you know, could you hold up for thirty minutes? We'll have a weather delay. American Airlines does it. They don't have a problem doing it. God could have certainly done that and said, just, just hold up for 30 minutes. There's a squall. And I know you don't have radar. It's too early for that. But, but I'll just tell you when to go. And now's not the good time. He didn't do that. God just let him sail right into a storm. Now, was God trying to punish them or teach them a lesson? No. It's just the fact that we live in a fallen world. Storms happen. Things go up and down. Things cycle. You go through good times. You go through hard times. There's, you don't need to read anything into it. That's right. Why me, Lord? Man, I'll tell you something about Austin that I've learned. Is they play country music early and loud in Austin. I heard more country music yesterday morning than I've heard in a year. And, and, and you can get an attitude if you get... Once, I didn't hear this yesterday, but uh, I'd love to write down some of these lyrics because they're pitiful. You know? <laughs> you know, One old guy says, I'm not broke, but I'm badly bent. It's like, oh, Wow. <laughs> and it just goes on and poor old me and look what life has done to me and my truck and, 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 and it just goes on and on and people live like that they go through something and they can't ever get over it they're trying to read something into it like God, what's God trying to say he wasn't trying to say anything there was a storm and storms happen on this planet they, they happen frequently and, and sometimes you sail into them, and sometimes you drive through them, and sometimes you fly through them. And, and so they do happen. Yeah. And so, but it was the last thing they would have thought. I mean, think about it. If you get on a boat with Jesus, you would pro- pretty much think, as long as we're on this boat, my troubles are over. But, but that's not what they experience. God never promised you smooth sailing. He never promised you that everything was going to be roses if you follow him. Things happen. We need to be ready for anything. So they sailed into the storm. Jesus was asleep. And, and uh, I, I haven't taken time to lay out the case that God likes faith, that faith pleases God, and how important faith is to God. But it is. And here's what the disciples said. Right in the middle of this storm, right after they'd had a camp meeting, they'd been with Jesus for three days. He'd been teaching them. They'd seen miracles. And now they're on the boat with Jesus. A storm arose. And here's what they said. They came to him and they awoke him saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. In other words, we're all going to die. This Messiah thing was really starting to take off. It's so Sad, it has to end this way. I mean, you, I really believe you could have done what you said. It's just so, in fact, we thought about letting you sleep. I mean, there's nothing we can do. We, we thought maybe you wouldn't want to drown in your sleep. So we decided to wake you up and you could drown awake. Maybe you want to have a little devotion before we go down. But we're going to die. We're all going to die. And, and uh, it's just, you know, it's very unfortunate. That, that we timed it the way we did. In fact, I, if you think back, I told you it didn't look like a good time to, to take this journey, but, you know, who am I? So I just, uh, you know, if there's anything that we need to do before we all die, let's just do that now. <laughs> Jesus was not impressed with that kind of reaction. We're all going to die. It's like, it's like he had put into them and chosen them and let them see things and hear things that nobody else had ever seen. And 15 minutes, they throw it all away. 
one little storm. And they're like, it's over. We are dead. It, that we're, I'm dead. You're dead. We're all dead. We're dead. And Jesus was not impressed. Now, do I have to bring this into the now? We get trained in faith for 30 years. Feeding on the word and believing God and hearing the best teachers that have ever lived. And one pandemic and Christians act like God's dead. There is no God. My God, we're gonna, what's happened? We, we need to get a hold of ourselves. <laughs> now, I'm not pointing my finger, but I, I was disappointed. I'm sure you were too. At certain certain people and the way p- people reacted, and I'm I'm not opposed to people being safe and whatever you do, whatever's you, you know you think is best. But but whatever we do, we can't forget that we have a God and that God has made us promises, and and we need to believe God that we're going to live and not die. And every time I start talking like that, people go like, "Well, who do you think you are? Why would you single yourself?" Well, I don't think I'm anything, but I read the Bible. I didn't write Psalm 91. It said in Psalm 91, a thousand will fall at my side and 10,000 at my right hand, but it shall not come near me. I didn't write that. God wrote that. I'm just dumb enough to believe it. I actually believe that. So when did we become weird and crazy for believing the Bible? These promises and people quote them. It's what John Osteen used to say. He was Baptist and he got filled with the Spirit and they kicked him out. And he said, we used to sing, oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. And I got one more and they kicked me out. (laughs) You know, it's like, we read Psalm 91 and Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And they are worrying themselves to death in the valley of the shadow of death. We were supposed to be ready for that. Is it just a poem or do you take it seriously? Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not fear. That's still in there. So who does that work for? Whoever believes it. Man, if you throw in the towel and say, Master, Master, we're all going to die. That's not faith. It's not going to work for you. So, So they woke up Jesus with this pitiful plea. He wakes up. And what he did was really remarkable. It shows you how God's standards for faith are different than ours. Jesus stood on the bow of the ship and spoke to the storm and said, peace be still. And the storm ceased. What a moment. I mean, that would be a time to go, whoa, thank you, Lord. That was a miracle. You are amazing. And that's what was their reaction. That was their reaction. Now, Jesus could have taken that moment to say, I told you I was God. You better stick with me, boys. There's more where that came from. He didn't say anything like that. You know what he said? We could read it. It said in verse 24, then he arose and rebuked the wind, the raging of the water, and they ceased, and there was calm. And he said to them, where's your faith? Wow. Wow. Where's your faith? You ever felt like that? He didn't say, look what I did. Don't you wish you could do something like that? He said, where's your faith? One storm and you're already preparing your funeral? Where's your faith? Use your faith. In other words, he didn't say, only I could do something like that. He's acting like they have a part to play. Now, in their defense, they could have said, well, Lord, we used faith to get in the boat. You said, get in the boat. We got in the boat. You said, come, we came. You you told, you know, Matthew was a tax collector, and uh, Jesus said, follow me. And he left his job and followed Jesus. That took faith. How many of you know that's faith? Every single one of them had, had, had gotten where they were by faith. They'd given up their reputations. They'd given up their job. They had uh, forever aligned themselves with Jesus. They'd really put a lot of uh, confidence and, and, and dependence on the fact that he was the Messiah. They had all used faith to get in that boat. But I want to tell you that there's more than just faith to submit 
and faith to yield to the Lord and faith to be saved and faith to yield to his will for your life. There is a faith to yield, but there's also a faith to resist. Yeah, that's good. And they didn't realize that that was necessary. And a lot of Christians today don't either. Yeah. They've learned how to yield. They yield to everything. Yield to the Lord, they yield to the word, they yield to the law, they yield to the devil, <laughs> yield to the mafia, whatever you, you know, they're just really good at yielding. <laughs> go sit down, go get up, go shut up. Yes, 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 yes. They yield. But there are times when challenges come that are anti-scriptural. They're against the word. They're against what God promised. Right. And the Lord expects us not to just sit there, but to rise up on the inside and to resist by faith, to stand against these things and to believe God in, a, in an active, proactive way. Amen. Do you understand that? So there's a faith to submit, but there's also a faith to resist. And you see it in James chapter four. It says, submit to God. How many of you believe that's true? Yeah. But then you also have to, at times, resist the devil. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. So it's like a muscle. It's like you have one muscle that does that and another one that does They're opposing muscles. Yeah. And so if all you ever do is submit. You're never going to really realize and understand the faith to resist. And that is a kind of faith that God wants us to experience. That's the kind of faith that overcomes. That's the kind of faith that moves mountains. That's the kind of faith that calms storms. That's the kind of faith that allows you to experience the victory of Christ in your life. Isn't that cool? He wants us to walk in some level of victory that he did. We're supposed to go everywhere in triumph in him, triumphing in him. And, and that's how is it that certain challenges come along and we need not be caught off guard, but be ready to believe God in the midst of every challenge. Amen. Good. He wants us to participate not, not just sit back and watch. And Jesus was doing that even in those days when they had so little. They weren't born again. They weren't filled with the Spirit. And he still wanted them to participate. But how much more today? He doesn't want you to just, as a Christian, just sit in a bubble and let him do everything for you. He wants us to do this together. We're in the game. We're not on the bench. We're in the game, playing every play, experiencing life. <laughs> and we need to quit acting like we're on some kind of Christian tour. <laughs> you know, I went to Israel one time. If you want to go on a good tour, that's fun because they got these big, nice buses, air conditioned, and they go to five star hotels. And it's like your biggest decision is what am I going to eat on the buffet tonight? Because I can't eat it all. Tried that last night. <laughs> Not to pick and choose. And, and, and you get this idea that it's all about just touring. And, and, and uh, the difference is, it's like we're on the bus, all right. But when you get off, instead of beaches and, 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 and suntan lotion, you're in a war. They're shooting at you. You're dealing with real challenges and real opposition. We're not here to see how much fun we can have. We're, we're here to, to, to make a stand, to make a statement, to believe God. To live for God, to live by faith, and and um, man, that's what that's what the Lord He wants to live life with us and live life through us. But we're not spectators; we we participate in this. You know, I've I would love to be able to commute to work like preachers. I wish preachers could live in heaven. And then just come to earth for work, you know, and then go back to heaven on nights and weekends. Yes. But we all live through this together. Yes. We're all dealing with the same stuff. And, and, and uh, you, you, just, you just have to look at what's around us and then look at the word and say, how am I going to approach this? I, I'm going to find a way to trust God in my situation. Yes. Yep. I'm not going to put it in neutral. And just see what happens, or coast. I'll give you one more example. I just was talking about this yesterday. In Mark chapter 11, and um, this is a great, um, the, some of the great faith teachings that Jesus um, 
shared with his disciples and with us. But um, I want to go back before that. <laughs> it, this really is kind of funny to me, but Mark chapter 11, verse 12. It, it, the, now, the next day when they come out of Bethany, Jesus was hungry. And seeing uh, from afar a fig tree having leaves, he went to see if perhaps he could find something on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. In response, Jesus said to it, let no one eat fruit from you ever again. And his disciples heard it. And you know, they never could understand Jesus. They're probably like looking at each other like, well, that was different. <laughs> never seen him do that before. Well, he's hangry. Don't mess with him. Right Somebody get him a hot dog. He's hungry. <laughs> you don't want God to get angry. So, so anyway, for whatever reason, I believe he did it to probably to teach him, but he wasn't happy. And he spoke to that tree. Well, when he spoke to the tree, nothing happened to me immediately. When you speak the word of faith, you don't always see something happen immediately. But look at verse 20. It says, now in the morning... As they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up by the roots. Now the disciples are like, man, that's pretty cool. Did you see that tree? He killed that tree. Jesus killed that tree. They were blown away. And so Peter, of course, the spokesman, he remembered and said, Rabbi, look, the tree which you cursed has withered away. Now, at this point, Jesus could have said, I told you I was the son of God. <laughs> And I can do even more than that. In fact, I can do it to people. <laughs> you better watch out. <laughs> better do what I say. I told you I was the Messiah. Don't ever doubt. <laughs> but he didn't say that at all. Not at all. That was not his, his response at this moment. Because when it came to faith, he was constantly trying to draw everybody else in. He was constantly trying to get everybody else yeah. to participate. Yeah. That's right. He said, don't you sit back and watch me curse trees. Right. So here's the picture. There's a dead tree here. They are in awe of Jesus. And Jesus goes, says this. He goes, so you're impressed with that tree? Because I did that to the tree. He said, well, let me just tell you this. So I think he's looking around for something bigger than a tree. And he goes, you think that was something? You see that mountain right there? Whoever, not me, whoever. Not me, you guys. You could speak to that mountain and say, be removed and cast into the sea. That's right. And if you don't doubt, yeah. it'll obey you, not me, you. Do you see how he did that? So you think me cursing a tree something, you could move a mountain. Amen. So how am I going to do that? By faith. Yeah, amen. He's saying if you'll get involved, you can do a whole lot more than this. And obviously, we're not interested in killing trees and moving literal mountains. But these things represent the challenges that we do face and the things that we can't move on our own. And if we, Jesus was saying, get in the game. Don't sit back and wait for me to do it. That was just a sample. You could move the mountain. I'm not going to move the mountain. You move the mountain. You believe God and you deal with your own mountains. And, and you'll see that it's a, it's, it's a, a joint venture. But, but we, bring, we bring the faith. So it's important that when we face things as we do in society, because I don't think we're done. I, I think there are a lot of other things that are, we're going to face as a nation, as believers, and I don't know what they are. <laughs> I'm going to say this here because we're friends, and you can straighten it out later, but... <laughs> I'm sorry, but I'm not just hanging on a, the words of a Facebook prophet to tell me that things are going to be all right or not. Amen. I am not going to sit around and wait for the next prophet to utter the next yeah. crumb so that I can hold on to it yeah. and, and, and believe something that the Bible has already told me. Yeah. That's right. We get our faith from the word of God. 
And I thank God for every ministry gift. But I tell you, I think some Christians have been crippled right. by waiting for some prophet to give them their next yeah. hope. That's right. and, they, and they're not living their life. They have to wait for the next release. And you can just get the word of God and f get it straight from God. Amen. Do I know what's going to happen? No, but I'm not wrong either. Mm. <laughs> no, I don't know what's going to happen. But I don't care what it is. The answer is still the same. It's always the same. We're going to face it by faith. Whether it's the principalities or powers or rulers in this world or rulers to come, death, life, any other power, we face them by faith. We overcome by faith in God's word. Thank God for his word. Amen. And, and, and I'd rather hear it straight from God. And put my life in gear. That's right. Wow. I really don't uh, talk about politics. I, I especially not in my in my uh, TV broadcast because I don't want to date them. I want them to be good ten years from now. But but I'm going to tell you something. I don't know who's going to get in the White House next. But I'm not going to put my life on hold until they get there. And I'm not going to hold my breath every month. Every month you hear Trump's coming back. Trump's coming back. What? I mean, when do we move on? Um, and, 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 and hopefully, you know, we'll have a, a, a good outcome and things will turn around. But I'm not going to put my life on it. You, know, you see what I'm saying? I, I don't, I'm looking at this from, trying to look at it from a broad perspective, caring about people. My mom's one of them. <laughs> I get all this from my mom because she's watching this all the time. And she'll say, well, you know, he's coming back. I said, when? August. I said, how's he going to do that? Military. Oh, okay. <laughs> she said, well, you know, my sister was telling me about all this stuff on the phone, but she had to quit talking because they're listening. I said, she's 80 years old. <laughs> You're 80 years old. You think the CIA is listening to y'all? <laughs> that you have some kind of national secret that they don't know. <laughs> well, I'm glad you didn't give it away. <laughs> Just hold on to that information. So I'm not, I'm not trying to be antagonistic. I love these people. But I, as, as a teacher and as, a, as someone who cares about the body of Christ, I want us to move forward. We don't have to put our life on hold because of what's going on in Washington. I'm going to live my life. And when it encroaches on my life, my rights, my privileges, my Christian duty, we're going to have a showdown. And I don't care who's in the White House. That's going to happen. Now, thank God we pray and we believe God and things can turn around and I, I want that. But I can't predict it. I don't know what's going to happen, but I do know this. I'm going to live for God. I'm going to overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of my testimony. How about you? Amen. No, I'm not, I'm not trying to be negative about anything. I'm just saying don't hang all your hopes on one man or one party or one outcome. Uh, God's bigger than that. Right. He's bigger than that. Amen. And if I find out what those national secrets are that my wife, that my aunt has, I'll let you know. <laughs> it's just, it's, just um, it's fascinating to me how different people respond and I'm doing my best to bring my supply yeah. and help people to feed on the word so that whatever happens, we're going to be ready for it. Amen? Amen. Amen. We're going to be ready. No matter what happens, we are ready. Amen. Hallelujah. And you know what? I'll say this and then I'm going to close. I've been traveling for 30 years and I have watched steadily as the church met less and less. We have shorter and shorter meetings. We used to do Sunday through Friday. And then we do Sunday through Wednesday, and then people quit coming, and we do Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and then Sunday, and, and I mean, it's just gotten where church attendance, the spiritual temperature has gotten lower and lower. And the truth is, in the process, the world's quit listening to us. We don't have their attention, but that could change. Yeah. When everything they trust in falls, I believe they're coming back. And I would rather reach a world in torment, turmoil. I'd rather reach a world in turmoil than lose a world at peace. Good. Yeah. I, I would rather. That, that would be my choice. Yeah. So if it takes some, some challenges and some shakeups for us to reach our generation, 
I want to be ready. And I don't want to get so caught up in the process that I'm not any good. That's right. That's good. Yeah. How do you like that? I, I mean, it's, it, it, we, we actually do have an opportunity to, to, yeah. to, to have the ear of the world once more. I believe the Lord spoke to me and said, I'm going to tune their ears to your voice. I'm going to tune their ears so they're going to be able to hear once again. And so I want to be ready. So you know what I've done? I've made so much material. I've been making stuff that nobody even buys. <laughs> I got stuff going. It's totally by you talk about by faith. I'm making all these series and then I'm studying, make another one, and I study. I've got eight series right now, I haven't even released yet. Wow. Eight series that I haven't released. One of them I did because I felt like the Lord was saying, we're gonna have to present these truths to another generation of people. Yeah. And they aren't gonna wanna go hear what Kenneth Hagin said or John Osteen said or Martin Luther said or John Wesley said. They wanna know what what do you say? So I did, a, I did a series on the gift of the Holy Spirit. And it was so much fun as I was telling some of my experience when I was filled and went back. And then it just dawned on me. A whole new generation needs to be introduced yes. to the Holy Spirit yes. and to faith yes. and to redemption and to yes. prayer. And they need, they're going to need it. And we need to make it simple. And, and I'm a transgenerational speaker. <laughs> I said that deliberately. I didn't want to misdo that one. I'm a transgenerational speaker. I want to, I make it simple. I, 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 I strive for simplicity. And so that when people come that don't know anything, they understand it. And, and they, they may not agree with it, but they understand it. And they can receive it. So I had this guy, the other day I was in a church and he came up and he said, I just want you to know, my six-year-old and nine-year-old sons listen to you every night and they love your teaching. I said, mission accomplished. That's what I want to hear. If I can speak on a six-year-old level, that's fine with me. That's fine with me because we want to make sure that everything is, is, uh, is understandable when the people want to understand it, then they can so I'm excited. Are you excited about the future? I'm not, I am not de defeated or disappointed or depressed. Uh, we were born for these days. Hallelujah.